Hi everyone, thank you for coming to the webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. My name is Kate Richter, I'm a senior at the University of Arizona and a CCAST case study intern based in Tucson. I joined CCAST last fall through the Arizona Institute of Resilience's Earth Grant Program and have been focused on developing CCAST species case studies on aquatic restoration. CCAST is intended to support landscape scale conservation and restoration by enhancing issue-based peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through the development of case studies, workshops, and webinars like today's. We use case studies as a foundation for communities of practice to address aquatic restoration, drought and climate adaptation, grassland restoration, and introduced aquatic species. If you would like more information on CCAST or our communities of practice, please feel free to email Anna directly. She's going to drop her email in the chat for those who are interested. Sorry. So we're gonna dive back into our webinar today. We're hosting a presentation from Larry Stevens about Spring Stewardship Institute's work monitoring springs for the Four Forest Restoration Initiative and throughout the Colorado River Basin. So I'm just gonna close out the poll. Um, we're also developing this project into a CCAS case study, so keep a lookout for that in the next few months. Dr. Larry Stevens is the director of the Spring Stewardship Institute and curator of ecology at the Museum of Northern Arizona. He received his PhD in zoology from Northern Arizona University and served as the ecologist for Grand Canyon National Park for several years. While respected in the field of ecology, Dr. Stevens is the editor for Red Lake Books, has served on many ecological councils in Arizona, and conducted research on biogeography and springs ecology. A final reminder before I turn it over to our speaker, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box and I will relay them after the presentation. With that, Larry, we're ready for you. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. Pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, uh, today's topic is uh, the issue of springs ecosystem in the Colorado River Basin and the role of the Four Forest Restoration Initiative in helping better understand how springs function in, re in response to climate change. This work has been funded by the U.S. Forest Service and through the, uh, the uh, four, what we call the Four Fry Steering Committee. Uh, for the last four years, and we're in the final year of the of this uh, this research. So today I'll be presenting a, a little bit of uh, preliminary information on the on the project, but trying to place the the uh, the role of science here in relation to the landscape uh, uh, studies that we've been doing on springs throughout the throughout the region. First, to get clear about what we're talking about, springs are ecosystems where groundwater reaches and usually flows from the Earth's surface. So in kind of management jargon, these are subsurface to surface linked, groundwater dependent, bottom up headwater wetland ecosystems, recognizing that pretty much every uh, uh, word within that uh, sentence means something to, to different kinds of ecosystem managers. Springs are important because they're the uh, places where uh, water is recycled on earth. All the water on earth is recycled through springs on the seafloor about every eight to 10 million years. They are quite likely the, the uh, place where life could have originated on Earth. They're ecologically highly interactive or keystone ecosystems serving as paleorefugia. Springs make up a tiny proportion of the landscape but support uh, more than 17% of, of the Earth's, uh, of the, sorry, of the US's endangered species. Uh, here in the Southwest, more than 1200 rare uh, species are supported at springs. Everywhere, they are gravely threatened ecosystems. Everywhere on Earth, but if uh, but they're quite resilient and sustainable and restorable if the aquifer remains relatively in, in, intact. And it's important to to protect the source area, which is usually the hot spot of biodiversity. Importantly, there's no national conservation attention being paid to springs as ecosystems. For that reason, we began the Spring Stewardship Institute about uh, uh, twelve years ago. With the Spring Stewardship Institute, uh, we provide tools, database, uh, a database for the archival and reporting of inventory assessment, monitoring data, pretty much any data you could think of gathering at a spring can be incorporated into the database. It's uh, broadly applicable, flexible, comprehensive, relational, allowing a look at var various uh, variables in relation to each other. And uh, it's broadly uh, uh, and it's secure, easy to use and freely available online. So our, our mission is to improve springs ecosystem science and stewardship, and what's good for springs is good for all things in our view. 
Today's presentation, uh, we'll, we'll talk about concepts in ecosystem conservation, uh, look at Colorado River Basin Springs geography and ecology, then focus on springs and the four forest restoration initiative with springs as indicators of climate change. We'll look at some of the status and results of the work that's in progress. As I say, this is the fourth, uh, the, the, this is the uh, fourth year of a five-year project. All of what we'll be talking about is related to this ecosystem model, this conceptual diagram of how springs function. In it, the, uh, uh, the geologic context and regional climate uh, interactions affect the aquifer, which affects the site geomorphology and microclimate, which are acted upon it, by the disturbance regime the spring emerges in, say it's on a stream floor at the base of a cliff, and the productivity uh, of, of that environment. So um, those things contribute to the habitat template. The, the, that habitat template is the format on which life develops through biogeographic processes. When you arrive at a spring, you see species uh, interacting with each other in, in a trophic fashion, and all of that changes through time, from daily to through uh, interannually. Humans step into the process and affect all aspects of the ecosystem, can, can, can affect uh, pretty much everything within that ecosystem, and, and we certainly do that. So with that um, uh, relationship, we, we created the Springs, Springs Online database in uh, Spring Stewardship Institute to allow us to, uh, to interact, uh, relate all these different processes and uh, components of springs ecosystem ecology uh, into one system to begin to ask questions we haven't even thought about yet. Uh, this is database is again, uh, quite uh, comprehensive. We include an assessment process based on measurements and expert opinion in it with, uh, the, uh, with quantitative prioritization rather than a checkbox approach, allowing us to compare springs across landscapes. Stepping now to the Colorado River Basin, as most of you know, it's a complicated, big, uh, big uh, basin, 650,000 square kilometers, 244,000 square miles. Some work we've done uh, describing the springs in the system, the reference is shown there. Anybody's interested in that paper, happy to send them to you, uh, just let us know. But the Colorado River Basin is divided into an upper, uh, upper basin and a lower basin a political division rather than, of course, a natural div division, although the upper basin is largely fed by the, uh, by the Colorado Plateau and the lower basin is uh, largely in the, uh, the uh, geologic province that we call the Basin and Range province. So uh, a fascinating uh, uh, ba river basin to look at here, large, occupies one twelfth of the, of the North America. Um, and it's a landscape with a lot of springs, close to 30,000 springs have been reported uh, uh, in this landscape. The upper basin is a landscape in which resources are largely kind of extracted and exported. The red arrows here show, uh, show water being uh, diverted from the Colorado Plateau into the off, off basin landscapes. Uh, quite a few exports across the Rockies into the, into the uh, great, uh, uh, the Great Salt Lake area in uh, Utah, the river, of course, flowing downstream has to deliver on average 8.23 million acre feet of, of water per year into the lower Colorado River Basin, where most of it shipped to California. Some of it's diverted through the Central Arizona Project into, uh, into Arizona. A couple of uh, uh, within basin transfer, uh, transfers, small amount of water coming from off the basin through the Perea River drainage. And uh, this is a quite a complicated landscape. Density of springs is uh, rather low. Uh, again, uh, about 0 0.05 springs per square kilometer. And, uh, and delivering, at least in Arizona, delivering about uh, 0.6 cubic kilometers of, of water for the state per year. About 7% of the state's water use comes from water generated uh, by springs in the state. So most of the springs are small, but they're highly diverse, geomorphically, uh, geochemically. Uh, within uh, just the Colorado River Basin, we've identified at least 330 springs-dependent species of, of plants, invertebrates, and uh, invertebrates. The cultural values and economic values are enormous. 24 tribes in the landscape regard springs as sacred landscapes. 
Overall, about 53% of the Colorado River is derived from groundwater, meaning springs. Uh, the river serves about 40 million people in the Southwest for water and power needs. However, 70 to 95% of the springs, depending on which area you're looking at, have been degraded primarily by livestock watering practices and flow regulation. So we outline a lot of this information in that uh, 19, uh, 2021 paper. Here in the Southwest, groundwater is mostly derived from, from meteoric surface, sources, from atmospheric sources. But more than 90% of the precipitation that comes into the landscape is lost to evaporation, evapotranspiration. So springs are at higher risk in this arid region due to uh, extent, uh, intensive groundwater extraction and particularly as the climate warms. This makes some interesting good indicators for, uh, for, uh, for climate change. Groundwater flow paths on the Colorado Plateau and the Colorado River Basin are based on stacked aquifers. So the upper basin, this is a typical kind of your Grand Canyon uh, stratigraphy kind of landscape uh, showing that the, the uh, aquifers here are stacked on top of each other. There's a little aquitard, which is not a 19th century swimsuit. It's a, 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 a zone of rock that blocks downward flow of water. So the aquifer kind of sits on top of these aquifers, typically sandstone or limestone with a shale layer underneath. Uh, faults and fractures work through the landscape. At upper elevations, water, uh, uh, the water quality is high because, because the, uh, the uh, groundwater flow paths are short. So the water is cool and, and kind of iron poor, ion poor. As, you, as the water sinks deeper through multiple aquifers along these fault systems and fracture systems, the uh, groundwater becomes more warm and chemically enriched. So this is kind of a general uh, framework for how infiltration takes place uh, within the Colorado River Basin. Uh, this, uh, this, this pattern is typical. So we've got high quality water at lower elevations and warm chemically enriched water coming out at, at, uh, at, different, uh, uh, at different elevations. All right. Now, elevation matters a lot here. Although springs distribution um, uh, and springs discharge doesn't vary very much across elevations, pretty much a, uh, a uh, uh, uniform distribution of, 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 of uh, discharge across elevation. What happens is that water temperature uh, decreases across elevation, as does pH and specific conductance. Again, the waters coming out at lower elevations are minerally enriched, uh, they're warmer and, uh, and the pH uh, tends towards uh, towards towards alkalinity at the at the uh, lowest elevations. This is in part because of vegetation decomposition in marshy wet meadow springs at high elevation and uh, the emergence of of uh, uh, of uh, water through limestone layers at at the lowest elevation. So alkaline playa settings at the lowest lowest elevations are pretty characteristic here. What that means is the flow paths can, uh, and the water quality can be quite, vari quite, uh, quite variable uh, at different springs. Individual springs have very unique and distinctive patterns of, of uh, chemistry and, and uh, uh, their flow paths are, are quite discrete. In karstic landscapes, uh, springs such as Basie's Paradise in the Grand Canyon may have an, uh, as, as brief as an 18 hour flow path. Whereas large uh, pool forming springs coming out at lower elevations in uh, central Arizona, for example, like Montezuma Well, uh, the groundwater uh, is, is, is enriched with calcium carbonate and also arsenic because the groundwater's come in contact with the basement rock. The flow paths are quite long uh, and the flow, it may take uh, 13,000 years for a drop of water to make its way from the top of the San Francisco peaks uh, to its uh, southern discharge here at the at, the, at Montezuma Well, so very long flow paths mean that these meaning that these are eco, uh, evolutionarily quite stable environments. Montezuma Well is is uh, has the highest uh, concentration of unique species of any of any spring uh, any point actually in North America that we know of so far. So flow path affects the water quality and uh, the uh, temperature of the water coming out. 
There are a large array of spring types, 12 different spring types that we've been able to recognize. Uh, have a paper with a, a key to the various spring types uh, that are terrestrial. And uh, these, are, these are some of them showing you uh, some of the diversity there. In the, on the Colorado Plateau, the common spring types are, are springs that come out in fixed channels, we call those rheocrines, hill slope springs, helicrines, and hanging gardens. They, are, they vary in, in their distribution across elevation, but hanging gardens are among the most unusual springs in the, in the landscape. So these are, these are uh, uh, springs that come out under cliff surfaces. On the hang on the Colorado uh, the Colorado River basin, Rheocrine springs are most numerous. Uh, hill slope springs coming out of a hill slope also uh, quite common. Um, they are more abundant than our helicrines, which are wet meadow springs. We call these fens at high elevation, sienegas at low elevation, for no good reason that I can tell whatsoever. This is the same feature, but just coming out at different elevations. And then hanging gardens, this very unique uh, four corners kind of. Uh, spring system that comes out in northern Arizona, southern Utah. Springs are, are uh, even more fascinating to ecologists because they host a, a great array of, of microhabitat types. Uh, perhaps a dozen or 13 different microhabitats can, can, uh, uh, can exist at, one, at a single spring. And these are uh, habitats that each support their own suite of species. So if you can imagine all these different microhabitats all supporting different invertebrates, plants, and, uh, and even some vertebrate species at a, at a place like Thunder River. So this uh, microhabitat mosaic uh, is quite important to the reason that springs are such biodiverse systems. Now there are, uh, are a few listed plant species at, that occur at springs, many unlisted rare plants that, are, that show up at springs that don't get much attention. But place, the place where springs biodiversity really rocks is with uh, invertebrate life. Many, many uh, aquatic invertebrates are, are ent entirely endemic to springs. The poster child uh, amongst all these is Pergolopsis, the uh, spring snail. 180 species in this one genus of spring snail. These are tiny uh, sesame seed sized uh, 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 snails that are fully aquatic. Uh, most of them occur at just one or two or three springs. But within this array of microinvertebrates, uh, of, of, of macroinvertebrates that show up at springs, there are many forms that we don't, just don't know very much about. Aquatic mites, flatworms, isopods, oligochaetes, uh, and, and many others. Uh, don't yet have a very good understanding of the dryopoid beetle diversity at springs, but there are quite a few uh, that have been listed as unique species. Uh, just a, a couple of years ago, we, uh, we had a couple more species of aquatic moths. This is the only aquatic moth on, on the planet uh, that are springs dependent. Uh, uh, they, they showed up at a, at a stream just south of Flagstaff here. Uh, and uh, so quite a, quite a large array of, of taxa that we don't know very much about biologically. Some, and many of them don't even have names yet, haven't been described yet. Springs are also a place where both upland and riparian species come together. So, uh, so not only do you have a high concentration of springs species that are, uh, that are restricted to the spring, but also you have a large number of species from the surrounding environment that are coming in and existing at the spring. And this, this, this occurs both with plants as well as invertebrates. And, and, uh, and springs play a great role in the, in the uh, surrounding landscape as well. One of, uh, again, Montezuma Well has this really high concentration of, of unique invertebrate species, at least eight uni uh, unique invertebrate species living at Montezuma Well. Uh, fed uh, the, the kind of rabbit of that ecosystem is an amphipod. This little shrimp-like critter in the middle here. During the day, uh, the, the amphipod is is preyed upon by a by an array of visually feeding uh, aquatic insects. So uh, the amphipod has to leave the shoreline environment where the feeding is is uh, most rich for it, swim out to the middle of the pond, and hover there uh, uh, to get away from the from the aquatic insects. But at night, up from the depths of this sixty foot deep. Uh, well swim four species of leeches, two of which are unique to the to the well, 
and they can actually hear the clicking legs of the amphipod. So the amphipod has to swim from the middle of the pond back to the edge and cling motionless to the vegetation at night. So it spends its whole life going back and forth, escaping from predators. This is work that Dean Blinn has uh, uh, done just such great work on to describe this spring as an, as, a, uh, uh, as an ecosystem with a trophic cascade driven by predators that affect the dial, dial migration of an amphipod. So these are all springs in the Colorado River Basin landscape that, uh, that really contribute to our understanding of, of springs as a whole. But, uh, but humans really exact an, an, uh, a very important uh, and, and uh, persistent effect on springs. All through human history, through human evolutionary history, springs have been important to, to humans. Uh, Cuthbert and Ashley 2014 uh, reconstructed the paleo hydrology of the Olduvai Gorge in Africa where uh, human remains are found. And most of the re human remains are, are showing up at, at uh, Paleo Springs. Their hypothesis with it was, that, uh, was that humans retreated to springs during times of drought. They didn't consider as much the, uh, the very important function of springs as ambush points in the landscape. Not only do humans use springs as places to ambush prey, but large predators, especially back in Africa and, and in the early times here in North America, use springs as places to ambush people and other prey. So, uh, so the, the role of springs as ambush points in the landscape is, is, uh, is much overlooked. Uh, springs have, have continued to, to uh, persist as, as important cultural features across the landscape. Uh, for pretty much all the tribes, pretty much all cultures on earth, except perhaps the dominant white culture in, in our country. Uh, even in Europe, springs are regarded as, as uh, places where miracles happen. Our population is changing pretty rapidly. This is a, an analysis we did of the Colorado River Basin uh, from 19, uh, 1990 to 2010. And the population in red here uh, uh, red sections where the population doubled in a matter of 20 years. So these population centers are, notice that most of them are in the lower Colorado River Basin, a few scattered ones in the upper basin, but the lower basin is receiving and demanding the water from the upper basin to, uh, to meet the uh, water needs, uh, th particularly through a changing and drying climate. So uh, among the various things that humans do to, uh, to, to springs, we affect their flow by, by uh, pumping groundwater. Uh, we uh, water our livestock with, with, uh, with springs. Groundwater pollution is, a, is an issue in some areas. Uh, often disturb, we disturb the geomorphic configuration of the spring. We um, create uh, frag more fragmentation of habitat as we tend to dry them out. We divert their flow. We uh, love them to death at recreational, as recreational features both hiking destinations and say hot springs and whatnot. And we introduce a lot of non-native species into them. The, the biggest elephant in the room is of course, climate change, which is affecting uh, the infiltration of water into springs. So with that as background, we, we, uh, uh, we approach the, uh, uh, the four forest restoration initiative to try to uh, learn whether or not for improving forest management can increase groundwater supplies and improve springs habitat. The four, uh, Forest Restoration Initiative or FORFRI is a uh, very robust program uh, 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 treating uh, vast areas of, of Northern Arizona's forests to, uh, to improve stand structure, to improve the uh, uh, growth rate of trees make make uh, for, uh, for improved logging over time, and also potentially for delivering more water into the into the uh, into the system. Groundwater infiltration should increase as you remove forest cover and and uh, and um, reduce the amount of kind of dog hair thicket habitat to having large uh, larger trees that are more widely separated. So the hypothesis here is that we can improve groundwater infiltration and therefore springs discharge and uh, springs habitat quality by improving forest management. This is obviously not something that can happen in a, a single year. Climate is variable, rainfall is variable, uh, 
and therefore we need to pay uh, close attention to, uh, to how climate variability is affecting springs. The landscape of the Four Fry area is pretty much central area, Arizona. The four forests are uh, Coconino, uh, Apache Sick Graves, Kaibab, and, uh, and Tondo National Forest. So these are forests that, uh, in which treatments are taking place to, uh, uh, to thin the forest by control burning, by selective uh, uh, logging, and open the forest up. And, uh, and our effort here then is to look at springs within that landscape. Arizona overall, of course, has almost 11,000 springs, probably more than that actually, but the mapping is still uh, remains un incomplete. One thing you can see here is that the springs of Arizona are strongly aligned along the, uh, the prov provincial boundary between the Colorado Plateau and the Basin Range and in the Sky Islands and in Grand Canyon. So, uh, so the springs are clustered in mountains and escarpments. That makes the Four Fry study area particularly rich in springs to look at. Still only about 1,200 springs or about 11% of the springs in the state have been visited and looked at it as ecosystems. As I said before, about half a million acre feet uh, of, of water emerges from these springs, six or seven percent of Arizona's water annual water budget, and many of the springs are degraded. Um, so in the four fry process, uh, 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 effort, we have springs that are in low quality and springs that are in high, high ecological quality, and uh, those are all being, uh, all being evaluated here. Okay, so how do you approach, having this background information, how do you approach uh, an analysis of what forest treatments will be doing to springs? We thought about this for most of a year to try to get, uh, uh, to try to get it, uh, uh, the, the analysis uh, trimmed down to the bare minimum that we would need and, uh, and uh, decided to go with three kinds of treatments, three uh, look, uh, uh, two location treatments that are either within treatment areas, meaning places where forests are thinned or, or, or uh, versus the control areas outside the treatment areas. We're uh, particularly concerned with not wanting to influence uh, the treatment uh, with, the, with the area. So we, the springs that are outside the treatment areas are actually uh, as close as we can get them to the treatment area, but outside the local uh, watershed boundary. So therefore, they won't be, uh, won't be affected by the actual treatment uh, process. They remain as controls. So location is the first kind of treatment that we're, we're looking at here. The second is uh, the aquifer. We've got an, a broad array of, of, uh, of aquifers in throughout Arizona and Northern Arizona, but focusing here on igneous uh, basalt-based aquifers, which tend to be surficial, and, uh, and highly fractured versus sedimentary aquifers, particularly uh, the uh, Kaibab and, and Coconino sandstone aquifers that are on the, that, that are the surface of the Colorado Plateau in this portion of the landscape. So we've got a location uh, treatment, we've got an, uh, an aquifer treatment, and then spring types. We uh, decided to select helicrine and hill slope springs, two of the most common spring types in the landscape, but avoid rheocrines. Rheocrines are springs that come out in channels and therefore they're subject to, uh, to disturbance from, uh, uh, from flooding. And therefore we might not be able to see much change in patterns in those kind of uh, settings over time. So therefore we selected these two uh, uh, kinds of springs that are not much affected by overland flooding. Hill, helicrine and hill slope springs. So three treatment factors, uh, uh, given the uh, amount of work involved in inventorying springs, we selected seven replicated uh, springs that uh, in each of these uh, each of these types for each treatment combo. So we have a total of uh, seven times eight, eight factors to two to the third uh, uh, factor types here, gives us uh, 56 springs to, to be able to, to look at. These springs are, are, are monitored annually for discharge and habitat. And we also place uh, a, uh, uh, a hobo thermal sensor in the spring, which allows us to tell how long the spring is actually flowing. So that gives us uh, continuous flow data uh, for, for springs. And uh, 
Um, we inventory these springs in detail at the beginning of the project. We'll do that again at the end of the project this year to, uh, to understand uh, the full array of habitat changes that have taken place at these, at these sites. So that's our study design. Retreatment factors, seven springs for each of these treatment combinations, uh, monitoring them annually for habitat and flow, and then five years for uh, every uh, uh, each, uh, this uh, five-year uh, look at the, at the inventory of the habitat, biota, uh, and the condition of the spring. We also we are including the uh, the ecological assessment uh, of these springs in, in each of these. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. And so the springs are scattered across the landscape. Um, most of the uh, most of the uh, springs are uh, south of Flagstaff. A couple up in the San Francisco Peaks for the igneous. Uh, uh, aquifers that we have up there. Most of the ones along the Muggill Rim are, are where we have our, our uh, sedimentary aquifers, but uh, they're scattered across the entire landscape. All right, so <clears throat> we are concerned, of course, with climate here, and particularly precipitation patterns. Um, because springs are not necessarily responding just to the immediate climate conditions, but can have a lagged effect um, uh, with uh, climate impacts uh, that might be staggered over time. Uh, we've, we've been looking at climate here pretty carefully over uh, since 2017 and trying to understand what, uh, what effects uh, climate might have. It could be that you have not only a, a single uh, previous year's lag effect, but also perhaps a double year lag effect. Um, these are uh, analyses that are underway, so this, these are quite preliminary data at this point. But uh, in this array of, of uh, years that we've had, we've had a really good, uh, good array of years uh, with different climate to be able to look at here. And those have involved uh, uh, three patterns. A normal pattern here, such as 2017 shown in blue, is pretty high winter precipitation and pretty high summer precipitation. That's our normal bimodal climate pattern for Northern Arizona, has been uh, 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 through, through the last century or so. But another pattern we're beginning to pick up is uh, low winter precipitation. Infiltration is, uh, is most effective when we have large snowpacks. So a winter low precipitation, uh, such as we had in uh, 2022, shown here in black dash lines, Rather low winter precipitation, uh, coupled with uh, normal or high uh, summer precipitation, is a bit of a, a bit of a climate change pattern that we're we're, uh, we're beginning to detect in the landscape. Then, quite alarmingly, actually, uh, uh, in a couple of years recently, we've had uh, winters with low precipitation and summers without monsoons. So, 2020 uh, uh, shown uh, in red here is a, a, a winter with rather low precipitation, rather low snowpack. The snowpack arrives late, doesn't last very long, evaporates quickly. Remember, most of our incoming precipitation simply evaporates. And in winter, we have a process called sublimation that uh, where uh, winter snow is converted directly to water vapor uh, through the wind and lost to the atmosphere before it has a chance to sink in. So low winter precipitation, particularly in the warmer, uh, later winter, is uh, is uh, means uh, little infiltration taking place, and then uh, in two years, um, 2019 and 2020, we had almost no summer uh, monsoon at all. So these are this in my 50 years here, uh, those were very unusual years, not having any really any really uh, strong monsoon, or the monsoon arriving much too late for it to have much biological impact. Summer rains typically don't provide us with much infiltration because Again, warm temperatures, just that, that water is just evaporated out. So therefore, we, we were picking up three different patterns. Now, 2023 is, uh, uh, started out with uh, high winter precipitation. This uh, pattern will be pretty dramatic. It'll be quite interesting to see what happens with a, uh, if, if the monsoon is, is rich this year, we'll have an exceptionally wet year. And that will, uh, of course, the effects of that won't show up until 20, perhaps uh, 2024 if there's a lag effect. So the, the lag effect is something that these data are tending to show us might be going on. And so this graph shows the lagged response of, of, uh, 
of winters with uh, with discharge. Uh, the annual uh, annual precipitation uh, here in inches uh, relating to the discharge at springs that we've been able to measure. So this, uh, you know, you typically expect there to be more discharge occurring with a greater precipitation in these in the springs on the Colorado Plateau. Uh, however, we've got some very interesting patterns here because we've got a low winter, high summer uh, precipitation in uh, uh, 2018 that gives us this pattern in 2019, uh, a very high uh, year for discharge. And uh, also um, a uh, high, uh, the normal high, um, high winter precipitation and high summer precipitation in uh, these years here driving the process up. This 2019 is going to be uh, particularly problematic when it comes to modeling here. And we've got an overall relatively low relationship here, uh, low uh, coefficient of correlation across years in relation to annual precipitation and, and springs discharge. So lots of complexity. Uh, we, we will be uh, looking closely at the uh, monthly patterns of precipitation and, uh, and potential for, for lag effects here as, as we go through the analyses. All right. So um, what we're seeing, uh, the, the number of springs that go dry in the landscape. So these are ephemeral springs. This is something we haven't been able to study very well because there's so, uh, so few monitoring data on springs. But here we're seeing that across the array of years, there's been quite a difference in the number of springs that have been dry. And again, this 2019 is an uh, anomalous year because uh, both it and 2022, which had uh, have uh, this uh, low winter and high summer uh, precipitation pattern show uh, elevated springs going dry. That's interesting. Winter lows uh, should be the time when we see springs going dry. It seems to be the pattern here uh, and picked up in 2019 as well, even though overall discharge was higher in 2019. And uh, we can see this pattern of, of uh, uh, variation depending on, uh, depending on the, the monsoonal and the winter precipitation patterns. Anyway, so um, uh, the number of dry springs that go dry out of the 56 is also perhaps an indicator of of climate change here. As I said, we are also collecting uh, assessment data on the ecological integrity of the springs. This uh, springs eco uh, ecosystem assessment protocol that we use allows us to, to understand the condition, ecological condition of springs, the natural resource condition of the springs in relation to the risks that those springs face. Typically, this is a, a negative sloping line uh, of, uh, of springs across uh, increasing natural condition. Uh, and uh, and uh, therefore, we can identify which springs in the landscape might be worthy of, of some management attention. These kind of graphs typically show us that springs that have a, a low natural resource condition and a high risk are probably too far gone. Management here would probably not work because uh, uh, because of the, the spring is is um, uh, is uh, irrecoverable. Uh, number eight here is a spring at higher elevation that's actually under a highway uh, called Clover Spring. Uh, groundwater depletion and road silt, road salt, salting of the roads, which is done by the Arizona Department of Highways, um, is also really negatively affecting these springs up here. Springs that are in good condition uh, 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 are places where probably there's no management needed. These might be useful as reference sites. Um, occasional monitoring is worthwhile, but uh, no management attention is needed. Where management can help might be in the springs in the middle part of this diagram. Springs that where a little bit of, uh, of attention, management money going can improve the condition and reduce the risk and bring them into a more secure uh, site. Now, interestingly, in, this, in the four fry study area, uh, most of the springs on the upper half of this graph are basalt aquifers, shallow fractured aquifers. Um, they are they are tend to be regularly ephemeral, meaning that e uh, each year they'll, they'll they'll go dry. They may flow for a prolonged period after a good wet winter, but uh, but they tend to be dry. And also, kind of surprisingly, is that the karst aquifer springs that we have in this landscape coming out of the Kaibab limestone, which is not known as an aquifer farther north, 
in Grand Canyon, it's, it's almost worthless as an aquifer. But on the Southern Colorado Plateau, uh, these are uh, relatively strongly perennial springs. They tend not to go dry and, uh, and are uh, providing some of our highest quality spring habitats. Even though some of the basins, the individual catchments for some of these springs is incredibly small, they tend to be perennial. So this is quite a surprise from this, from this study is that the sedimentary aquifers can be, uh, can be so persistent even though they have very small catchments. So lots of uh, kind of intrigue going on with this, with this study and much more to be, uh, to be learned as we go through more of our monitoring and uh, anal an analyses. So uh, our progress has been somewhat stymied by implementation in treatment delays. Uh, Forest Service uh, uh, has, has some challenges in trying to get its, its uh, contractors out there to do the work, but that's, that's uh, been taking place the last year and a half in a, in a much more rapid way. Uh, project funding was reduced in this, uh, in this project, uh, making our lives as researchers much more difficult uh, because we simply don't have the resources to um, to get out there, and we end up doing a lot of work by uh, uh, pro bono on it. But <clears throat> we've got just a great uh, array of years now, particularly 2023 coming on, uh, to be a high flow year uh, for modeling purposes. We're comparing these springs also with a couple of long-term uh, sites that Abe Springer has, has worked on, and we'll be able to uh, adapt some of our modeling after some of his. And uh, and compare that with the uh, with uh, long term patterns that he's been he's been having at these uh, at several of his springs. Uh, habitat reduction uh, is expected during seasons of low flow. Uh, we see that the rate of recovery of that habitat probably uh, uh, is going to show that it's in relation to climate severity. The month by aquifer by spring type analyses are still underway. We're seeing a lag uh, lag response there that's quite interesting. And we'll uh, more more to be done there. Uh, consistent monitoring data is is now available for fifty six springs, which is um, one of the largest springs monitoring programs that uh, that I know of. So uh, we've got five good years. This is probably a project that will take ten more more years to really see results on, simply because it takes a, quite a while for the landscape to adjust to forest treatment, infiltration, and climate vari variability are all playing into that. But it's giving us new insights into the ephemerality of, of springs, particularly basalt aquifer springs that are often used for livestock watering. And they're at risk of, of uh, more at risk. They appear to be more at risk for climate change. We're also looking at the biota of these springs. Each spring has its own suite of invertebrate indicator species. So uh, it's not that you can use one species to tell, uh, tell much about how all the springs are doing, but it could be that the, the, the feeding gills of the aquatic invertebrates that exist at the springs are better indicators. What we know is if we see sepsid flies at a spring, we know we've got problems. If we see stone flies, we know we've got uh, kind of good ecological conditions, but sepsid flies, uh, larvae live in kind of muck, and uh, they're often uh, seem to be indicators of, of poor quality at springs. They're, they differ in their feeding, uh, uh, strategies and therefore those feeding strategies might be the indicators that we're that we use for uh, using invertebrates as as uh, indicators of, of climate change impacts on springs and human impacts on springs. And from this, we're getting uh, prioritized stewardship recommendations to help the Forest Service treat these springs. At the larger scale. Um, we need as a, as a species to understand and protect our groundwater and springs better. The groundwater is humanity's last good source of fresh water. Um, there's a two to five fold increase in groundwater use during drought. And that's really problematic because, uh, because we draw down our, our groundwater tables and uh, create sub landscape subsidence and, and collapse the, uh, the water storage potential. We've seen this uh, in, in a number of places. And that is uh, limiting the ability of the, of the earth to actually receive infiltrating water. So pretty much everywhere on earth, groundwater uh, sources are being threatened by depletion and climate change. Good, but good options exist for protection of, of both groundwater and, and springs. If we can identify the infiltration sites and the processes and the role of evapotranspiration, we can, and, and we protect the quality of the incoming water, we can manage water sustainably. And, and springs 
uh, have been shown through multiple restoration activities to be quite resilient. If the aquifer is relatively intact, the spring can be, can be restored. Springs are important because they're hot spots of biocultural diversity. They're kind of the canary's canary of ecological indicators as far as we're concerned. Uh, they're important both internally for their internal processes of biodiversity and also because they really affect the health of the adjacent lands and the cultures that rely upon them. So if the aquifer is in good condition, springs can be relatively easily sustainably managed. So our work at Spring Stewardship uh, Institute is uh, more than just this one project. We're, we're working globally on springs and um, got some interesting papers if you want to uh, uh, visit our website, uh, those, those papers are, are advertised there. Uh, but again, we're trying to provide uh, uh, improved uh, ecosystem science and stewardship of springs and uh, uh, by providing the tools and the abilities for anyone interested in springs to, uh, to uh, access those tools and to, and to better manage their springs. So thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions. I'll have, have to have some help uh, in doing so. But I uh, really appreciate the time today and it's and, uh, been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much, Larry. It looks like we have some good questions in the chat. Just to respect everyone's time, I am going to cut questions off at two so everyone is able to get out of here. Um, so I apologize in advance if we don't make it to your question. But Ariel asked if the proportion of springs or spring flow, oh, what is the proportion of springs and spring flow for helicrine and hill slope springs versus others in the four fry area? Are there more common or productive ones compared to other spring types on the landscape? Yes, uh, so rheocrine springs are, are again, uh, also a common spring type. They, can, they contribute to, uh, uh, oftentimes contribute to perennial streams uh, in, the, in the area. We don't have that many perennial streams. So their, um, their importance in, in the four fry area is not quite as great as they are elsewhere. But, uh, but that's a spring type that we uh, uh, would like to pay more attention to. There's some monitoring going on through the Forest Service of those, but, um, but uh, for us, the disturbance factor is so great that we would have a hard time determining how they're uh, contributing to the, to the flow. So we've avoided those focusing on these other two, which are uh, quite common and, quite, and provide a lot of the flow of the, of the, uh, uh, on the four fry area. And Mass Max asks if you are seeing reductions in spring discharge as a result of shifts from snow to rain dominated precipitation regimes. Yeah, good point. Some landscapes uh, uh, can receive infiltration of, of uh, rainwater, of monsoonal water through fractures in the landscape. So in southern Arizona, that's probably the dominant way that groundwater infiltration takes place. There have been some good studies around Tucson on that. However, here on the plateau, it's, uh, it's all about snow, snowpack. Uh, in, uh, melting snow as, uh, saturates the ground, uh, and that allows that water to sink in deeply. Summer monsoons here are simply too flashy, and uh, temperatures are too high, really, to allow very much uh, uh, precipitation to, to pass in, except in very specific spots. Uh, some uh, the uh, bottomless pits area, and some other some other uh, uh, places where groundwater can simply fall through the uh, through fractures in the karst terrain and get down to the groundwater. Some of those sites can be productive for rainfall, but for the most part, it's snowpack. And then John says, from the risk versus condition matrix, it looks like springs originating in basalt aquifers just generally have higher risk scores. Does that reflect degraded conditions, or does the risk index inevitably assign higher risk numbers to springs that are ephemeral? If it's the latter, it seems like you might need a separate index for ephemeral springs. Yes. Uh, so uh, again, this is the first study at which we've been able to begin to quantify ephemerality of springs. And it looks like the basalt aquifers are more at risk. They have a very different flora and fauna. You can tell pretty much just by uh, arriving and doing an inventory, whether the spring is, is ephemeral or not. And uh, that assessment process for what you'd be actually trying to accomplish at an ephemeral spring, uh, those goals would be quite different than, than, for, than for perennial springs. So there's much more discussion with the managers about what needs to be done to, uh, to manage uh, uh, aquifers, uh, uh, basalt aquifer springs, putting in more um, 
water catchments might be advisable in basalt for basalt springs, for example. Great, thank you. And then Leah says, it looks like there is a threshold of degradation after which you consider a spring too far gone and may not respond to restoration. Or is it just that the risks are too high to be worth prioritization? Those are management decisions. Uh, certainly if you fully dewater a spring, which has happened quite a, in quite a few situations, not so much on four fry, but, uh, but in some situations, um, if you fully dewater a spring, you've lost all the biological value. You still may have cultural value, you might have paleontological value, um, uh, but, uh, but uh, core biodiversity has been lost. So that's, that's a pretty, um, pretty sad situation to, to come across. Um, uh, springs that are, are uh, gradually becoming ephemeral uh, tend to go into a different uh, uh, geomorphic configuration. They, be, they become what we call hyp uh, hypocrines, where the groundwater is below the surface. And as that groundwater gradually sinks deeper and deeper because of, say, groundwater depletion uh, or climate change, uh, the various plant species that can access that water change with your last riparian species in Arizona being mesquite, which has the deepest tap roots, go down a couple hundred feet uh, into the earth. And those are the last species to be able to persist if the groundwater is really being drawn down that far. And it certainly has happened in the big urban areas in Arizona. And Leo's follow-up to that question was what sort of timelines to recovery you might expect with different management strategies? Yeah, very much depends on the aquifer. If you can recharge the aquifer or focus, uh, find the places where infiltration happens, focus uh, uh, perhaps putting a, uh, some kind of uh, barrier or dam on those sites where to, to really allow water to accumulate and drop into the aquifer. Um, and again, the, the size of the aquifer matters, the, uh, the amount of depletion matters and, uh, and other processes. So it, it very much is an aquifer dependent uh, uh, situation. Therefore, it takes good understanding of what the geologic structure is that's shaping those aquifers to be able to make uh, really informed management decisions. And then the last question is again from Ariel, and they say, what type of restoration activities do you recommend to increase resilience and health of springs and maintain high spring flow in the study region? Again, uh, understanding the aquifer is, is critically important for the spring as an ecosystem protecting the source area and the upper 50 to 100 meters of, of uh, spring brook is the, is the right way to do it. Leaving water for livestock and wildlife uh, uh, outside the protected area, but typically fencing the source, uh, uh, creating a stepping stone trail to the source if people are going up to the source to, to, uh, to access the, uh, um, the, the source area for water diversion. Um, but protecting that source area is, is the key feature uh, that we, we, we promote with Spring Stewardship Institute as a restoration strategy. Great, thank you so much, Larry. Thank you to everyone else for taking the time to join us. This webinar was recorded and will be made available on the CCAST YouTube channel where you can also find all our previous webinars. If you enjoy learning about these case studies, I encourage you to visit CCAST and the case study dashboard where we currently have 178 case studies. We are developing this project into a CCAST case study and it will also be available on our dashboard soon. We are also working on lining up webinar speakers for the coming months. Please contact us if you would like to receive the webinar announcements but are not yet on our mailing list. We thank you all for your time and thank you again to Larry for joining us to give this excellent presentation. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Larry.